What's up guys and welcome back to the channel for a new video where we will be discussing Ben Solo's fate at the end of The Rise of Skywalker and what really would have happened if the decision had been made to keep him alive. Now this is not going to be a fan fiction or an alternative timeline per se, but rather just an open discussion about what Ben Solo would have done if he had survived, how the galaxy may have received him if and when he revealed himself, and also why I believe the writers ultimately chose to kill him off. Now there are a few things I need to say before we really get into this topic. First of all, if you are someone who really does not like the sequels, this may not be the video for you because not only am I obviously talking about something that only has to do with the sequels, but I am also going to be sympathetic toward the character of Ben Solo in order to explain this discussion from both sides. Because there are two sides. There's people who believe that the decision to kill Ben Solo was righteous, and then there's other people who think it was the worst thing Disney could have done. So I'm going to explain both sides and then ultimately give my opinion on which one I think is right. Now, when I first saw The Rise of Skywalker in theaters, I was extremely happy and satisfied with the vast majority of the film. But as I have admitted to you guys many times before, the death of Ben Solo stood out like a sore thumb to me. It didn't sit well, and to be frank, it almost felt like it wasn't meant to happen. Like someone had forced in a last minute change where it so clearly didn't belong. And let me say that if you liked that decision and felt that it was the right play, that's great. I'm happy you were able to enjoy that and make sense of it, but for me and many others, it just didn't work. In a story where hope has always been the driving force, we had this character in Ben Solo who was literally named after Obi-Wan Kenobi who was his mother's last hope. And we kick the sequels off with two main characters, Rey and Ben, who are both stuck in a position of hopelessness. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, because we're only talking about the first of three movies. There's got to be somewhere for them to go, so starting from the bottom makes sense. But here's the problem. Rey begins her climb out of that darkness very quickly, and Ben helps her through that journey, saving her life multiple times along the way and pushing her to become what she is meant to be, no matter how uncomfortable and dangerous it may be for either one of them. And they both seem to be working toward this final destination where they will find the belonging they have been deprived of for so long. The Force Dyad seems to confirm this, and the kiss between them after Ben Solo commits to the light and saves Rey seals the deal. They've finally done it, the Dyad has come together, balance has been restored, and they are both finally free from the loneliness they've been consumed by for so long. The pain that only they can understand and only they can cure. But... Then, just as they discover that feeling for the first time, it's ripped away once again. Ben Solo falls back, disappears, and we are left to assume he's gone from the physical realm forever. So rather than finding his way back to the light and finally getting his life back, Ben essentially ends up as the gift that kept on giving until it finally killed him, and that seems like a very bad message to send. But there is another side to this argument, one that to many people is just as reasonable and fully justifies the decision to kill Ben Solo in The Rise of Skywalker. Many supporters of the decision are keen to point out that Ben would likely be convicted for his crimes, destined to live out his days in a prison cell, or even be sentenced to death. After all, he did murder his father as well as Lor Senteca in The Force Awakens, and regardless of his motives for these crimes, their blood was on his hands. He also ordered the execution of the innocent villagers on Jakku, which is certainly another heinous war crime to add to his list. It really isn't up for debate that those actions would result in the most serious of punishments under any normal circumstances. So let's break the events of the final act of Episode 9 down and see where things may have gone had Ben Solo lived. Now, the first question to address is how Ben would have survived. Would it simply be that he remained alive and well after reviving Rey on Exegol, or would he have disappeared for a while only to reappear to Rey on Tatooine like some fans were expecting? Let's explore both options. If Ben were to leave Exegol with Rey and return to the Resistance base, things would likely go south very quickly. Most of the Resistance fighters had no prior relations with him, and even those who did, like Chewie or even Finn, would not be open to accepting him. Now, would Chewbacca come around to Ben eventually? Probably. And could Finn and Poe even be convinced that he was a good man and he really has changed? Sure, but... I believe it would take some considerable heroic actions for Ben to really prove himself to the galaxy 
And under these circumstances, there's no opportunity for that because the first order and the final order have already been destroyed. The evil in the galaxy is gone. And so there's no way for Ben to prove himself. And I'm going to get into how that could have actually come together as we explore different scenarios in this video. Now understand why I'm saying this. Because I know a lot of you must be thinking, um, hello, Ben did help Rey to destroy the Emperor and literally saved the galaxy. And yes, you're absolutely right about that. But does anyone outside of Rey actually know about that? I don't think so. And unfortunately, Rey's word about Ben being a good guy now is not likely to be enough to convince the galaxy that he should be exempt from any punishments. However, there is another argument to be made here, and I'll make it in the form of a question. Just as nobody saw Ben Solo's heroic act on Exegol, what living beings saw his actions on Jakku in The Force Awakens, and how many people actually know what Kylo Ren even looks like beneath his mask? I'm not saying it would be right for him to be let off the hook for that, but there's always more context to these issues, and as I'm going to continue to hammer home in this video, these alternative endings are all about imagination and possibility. However, if we assume that at least somebody in the Resistance who Rey could not convince to give Ben a chance would recognize Kylo Ren and call him out, this scenario doesn't seem to be a very appealing situation for myself or for the Raylo fans who wanted to see Rey and Ben live happily ever after. Some may say that it's still better than him dying outright, leaving Rey all alone once again like we saw in the movie, but that's a matter of opinion and I don't know that the film would have been received much better had they gone in that direction. So what about the other option? What if the galaxy had presumed Kylo Ren to be dead? But then when Rey went to Tatooine to bury her master's lightsabers at the Skywalker homestead, instead of some old woman who we've never seen before approaching Rey to question her identity, it was Ben Solo who appeared to let her know that he was alright, that he would be around if she ever found herself in trouble, but that the galaxy would never accept his return, and so he had to go his own way. From here, Rey would likely insist that she go with Ben, that they run away together and leave everything else behind. Ben would insist that a life of exile was no life for her, that he had brought this upon himself, and that this punishment was his to serve alone. Now whether Rey would agree with this or not is up in the air, but we the audience would be left to wonder, to imagine the possibilities and question what may have happened. As the movie closed with Rey and Ben, the last Skywalker standing alongside the last Palpatine, watching the suns rise with great anticipation for whatever their future may hold. Now, many people may argue that this ending doesn't really make all that much of a difference, and so fans should just be happy with what we got. And that's a fair point, I suppose. But this scenario leaves the door open for imaginations to run wild. It rewards Ben Solo for facing the seemingly insurmountable challenges created by his past, and it gifts both he and Rey with that incredible sense of belonging that they had been craving for so long. And finally, it allows for Lucasfilm to pursue this story down the road, whether it be through Ben Solo eventually returning to protect the galaxy and atone for his sins, proving himself a good man and eventually being welcomed back due to the extremely unusual nature of his past life, or through Rey leading this double life where she goes back and forth between her life as a former resistance fighter and a Jedi master, training the next generation in secrecy alongside Ben. Again, the possibilities would be endless here, which is what makes this ending so much more appealing. Rather than closing the door on any chance of a happily ever after fairy tale ending for the trilogy's two main characters, you create happiness and endless curiosity for fans to wonder what may have happened. Just like we continue to do about Luke and Leia's lives after Return of the Jedi. They were given the happy ending they deserved, and we as fans loved that story because of that full circle conclusion. And I know in saying that, I'm gonna have some people who say that Vader died and everyone was still happy, so the same should go for Ben. But those situations are simply not the same. Vader was a victim of Palpatine's deception just like Ben, yes. But in his time on the dark side, like it or not, he became a truly terrible person with no remorse for the thousands of lives he had taken without hesitation. He and Ben are simply not the same when it comes to their motivations nor in their behavior. Their stories begin and end similarly, but their journeys are very different. But I've got plenty of videos where I break all of that down, so I'm going to leave that alone and address the third scenario, which is that Ben is actually redeemed earlier on in The Rise of Skywalker and has this reunion with Leia. 
Now this would really change things because now he has the word of both Rey and Leia, who is a very powerful and respected figure throughout the galaxy. So if Ben were to go to the Resistance, pledge his allegiance to the Light, and then head to Exegol with Rey and destroy the Final Order, the galaxy would not only have to recognize that Ben Solo just saved them, but Ben would also now have the support of General Leia Organa, who would have a powerful influence on his fate, and that's a really important thing to consider that I think a lot of people tend to leave out of this discussion. Yes, Ben did some bad things, but actions matter. And if the guy literally killed Darth Sidious and destroyed the entire First Order, that would undoubtedly be taken into consideration. Couple that with Leia's influence, and the punishment would not necessarily be a life sentence, as a lot of people have argued, at least not in my opinion. But again, that is just my opinion. I'm not here to tell you my word is the law, or to say anyone who disagrees with me is crazy. And let me just say for anyone who may feel that allowing Ben Solo to live a free man after his contributions to the First Order's ascension is unfair and maybe sends a bad message of its own, this would not be the first time we have seen this sort of thing in Star Wars. In fact, it actually happens quite frequently. Take a look at Boba Fett, or to a lesser degree Mayfeld, or any of the other criminals in The Mandalorian. I have never heard anyone complain about Boba returning, or about the fact that Mayfeld was allowed to walk away a free man just because he blew up an Imperial base. Even take a look at Han Solo, who served as a member of the Imperial Navy, and after that he was literally a smuggler. He made an illegal living for a good portion of his life. Yes, he was a good man at heart. These are all people that have done some bad things, but ultimately chose to do the right thing, and were granted freedom because their heroic actions made up for the evil they had wrought. And yeah, I know, we haven't actually seen any of these characters do that many bad things on screen, but the implication is definitely that they are bad people, or at least they did some bad things at different points in their lives. Now, were Kylo Ren's crimes greater than most of theirs? As far as his contributions to the evil wrought by the First Order, yes, no doubt. But, the actions he took upon his return to the light are also much greater than anything any of these other people did as well, so it's all relative. And this is where I think there's a big disconnect for some fans. People don't understand that Ben Solo too was a good man at heart. He was forced into a situation he did not choose and trapped there. The difference between him and the others I mentioned is that he was an extremely gifted force user in a place of great power which means that his influence over the galaxy comes across as far more devastating. But at the end of the day, Ben Solo was never the villain of this trilogy. That title belongs to Palpatine and to a lesser degree, Snoke. Ben was simply a lost man who had been manipulated and tricked into a dark situation which he could not climb out of on his own. The dark side consumed him as it does with everyone who commits to it. It made him feel as though he was now doing what he had to do, that his actions as Kylo Ren were justified, but Rey's arrival reawakens Ben Solo, and from that point forward, we see his conflict grow and grow until finally the light side wins him back over. There's actually a really interesting comparison I came across a few months ago when I was watching a new movie that had come out recently, but I've never really had the opportunity to share it until now, and I think it's appropriate given what I'm talking about here. I don't know how many of you guys have seen the movie Bad Boys for Life, the movie with Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, but if you have, you know, well, let me say spoiler warning if you haven't seen that movie and you're planning on seeing it at some point. But anyways, in that movie, Will Smith's character has a son who he didn't know about, and his son was raised by his mother, who is this extremely evil woman, she's into witchcraft and some really dark stuff, and she trains this kid from birth. She molds him into this deadly assassin, and he goes through the movie killing a lot of people on a mission to eventually kill his father too. But at the climax, he learns the truth, he finds out that Will Smith is his dad, and there's this emotional moment in this burning building, where he comes to realize that his mother has used him and lied to him, and in the end, he does the right thing. He does go to jail, but in the final scene, his dad comes to him and basically says, hey, I've got a job for you if you're interested, and it could knock some time off your sentence. And the audience is left to believe that he's about to be let out and go on this mission with his father now. And through that whole sequence, those last 20 to 30 minutes of the film, all I was thinking was, wow, you know, he's actually a lot like Kylo. And then when the final scene ended the way it did, it was like, thank you. Now that's how you end a movie. Their situations weren't identical, in fact, I would probably say that Kylo was more of a victim than this kid was, and also probably committed less evil actions, but you can definitely see the parallels. 
Now with that being said, I also want to say that the ability to transcend and become a force ghost, if that is what ultimately happened with Ben Solo, which again, as you guys know, I'm not entirely sold on, but if that is the case, it's really important to keep in mind how impactful that is. There's a reason that only a handful of characters have ever achieved this ability. The ability to transcend into the force is a powerful thing, and I think a lot of us, including myself at times, fail to realize just how big of a thing that is. I'm actually preparing a video where I talk about this exact topic. I'm not sure if it will be out before or after this video, but you guys will be able to get a better feel for what I mean when you watch that one. My big point here though is that because force ghosts are what they are, they're ghosts, they're not true living beings, and for a lot of people being a force ghost doesn't mean that much, it was not really a great storytelling decision to kill the trilogy's main victim after he finally found the strength to take his life back. But that is about all I've got to say about this topic right now, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this video up here. If you guys enjoyed, please remember to leave a like on this video, comment your thoughts on this alternative ending down below, and of course, may the force be with you always.